Hey, what's up everyone? Renaissance Coders here. Welcome back to the third episode in the Tap Shift series. In the last episode, we created our obstacles and pickups, so check that out if you need to. But today we're gonna to be moving forward. Today we're gonna to learn how to enforce our pickup rules for the invincibility and score pickups. We'll understand how to determine when the player loses. We'll add a game over screen, and then we'll start keeping track of player score. We have a lot to get into today, so let's go ahead and get started. I think one of the first things we should do in this tutorial so that everything else makes sense is to handle the 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 lose state. So we want to be able to, de to determine when the player loses and then reset the game when that happens. Okay, so to enforce some of those rules, we want to start off in our game controller. So here I have the game controller open. And let's just start off with one of the easiest detections, which is going to be detecting when the player falls off of the screen. So if the player stops tapping and they fall below the bounds of the screen, we want to make sure that they lose in that situation. So let's create a new method inside of our game controller. The name of our method is going to be private void detect player fall. And in here, we're just going to detect if the player is outside of the bounds of our screen in the negative direction. So what we'll actually do is make sure that we call detect player fall in the update method. So we'll come up here to our on update method and under check player progress, we will call detect player fall. So we know that every up update cycle, we are going to be determining if the player has fallen off the screen. In order to detect this, we want to check a relative position between the player's position, the player's Y position, and the camera's Y position. So how do we do that? Well, it'll be a simple conditional statement. So we'll say if the camera, let's see, let's see if we have a reference to our camera in the game controller yet. Doesn't look like we do, oh, we do, okay. So we have camera, so we'll use that as a reference here. If camera dot transform dot position dot Y, and then of course we're looking for the player, uh, the camera's position relative to the player. So what we'll do is we'll say if, if the camera's position dot Y minus the player's position dot Y, so minus player dot transform dot position dot Y is greater than some value, right? And that value is going to be the distance between the, uh, the middle of the screen and the bottom of the screen where we want the player to lose at. So we'll start off by just saying five and see what that looks like. And then if this condition evaluates to true, we want to call some function called end game. So let's create a new function called end game down here. We'll have a Boolean called uh, game over. And if game over is true, we just want to return. We want to make sure that we're not doing anything else. If it's not true, we just make sure that we set it to true. So we say game over is equal to true. And then here is where we would pause the player. We would play some animation for the player and we would turn on the game over screen. So we can add these comments here as a reminder so that we can come back to this and add all of these rules. For now, what we could do is call a reset function, which is simply going to reset all of the game's resources. So let's add another function down here called reset. So inside reset is where we might reset the score to zero. We would ask the obstacles to reset. So reset obstacles. We would also tell the camera to reset. And of course we would reset the player. So for the objects that we have access to right now, the obstacles, the camera, and the player, we can go ahead and add some code here. For the obstacles, we'll ideally have some method inside that controller called reset. So we can call that here. Our camera will also have a function called reset within it. And so will our player. So these are functions that we have yet to create, but those are gonna be um, implemented very shortly. In addition to resetting the obstacles, we want to make sure that we add uh, add a new obstacle. When we reset the game, we want to make sure that we clear the obstacles, but 
We also want to make sure that we're spawning a new one, just like we did whenever we handled the uh, initial uh, initialization of the game controller. So we can take this and drop it down here. Of course, this would indicate that we would want to reset our progress to the proper value. Let's see what we initialize that value to up here. So we initialized our progress to negative one. We want to make sure that we reset that to the proper value. So maybe we can do that right here. So we can say the progress is equal to negative one. And that would complete our reset function for now. Eventually, we'll come back and make sure that we're setting the score to zero as well. So I think in the last tutorial, we actually did implement the reset function for obstacles. Let's just take a look at that really quick. OK, so we did add a reset function for obstacles. Let's check the camera and the player. So camera controller here. So we need to add a new public member for resetting the camera. Let's check the player controller. And it looks like we need to add a reset function here as well. Okay, so for our player controller, what we'll do is initialize our target position to vector3.up times negative four. This will be zero on the x-axis, negative four on the y-axis, and zero on the z-axis. And then what we'll do is we'll set the transform position equal to that target position. So it snaps back to the starting position. Remember that our player does start off at this position. It, it doesn't start off at uh, vector 3.0. Of course, this could be different based on how you placed your camera and your player in the beginning. But if you follow it along up to this point, uh, this is the value that you would want. Let's go to the camera controller and uh, see what we do there. So this is gonna be a pretty similar implementation of the reset function. Essentially, we just wanna reset the position of the camera. But for the camera, we'll set the target position equal to the initial position, which I suppose we could have set up for the player, but we didn't. And then we'll set the position equal to that target position. Okay, with that, we can recap here what we've got. We have the detect player fall, which is going to see if the player's fallen off the bottom of the screen. If that happens, we'll end the game. Inside end game, we're checking to see if we've actually transitioned to this lost state. And if we have not yet, then we go ahead and make that transition. Inside, trans and inside this lost state, we'll make sure that we set game over to true, which is a Boolean we still need to create before we test this. We'll go ahead and pause the player and we'll play some sort of animation for the player. This is also where we turn on our game over screen and then we call it the reset function. Uh, the reset function is temporary until we actually get a game over screen. But what reset does is it just snaps everything back to their initial positions. So let's create this Boolean for game over and then we'll test this to see if it works. So up here, we'll just have a bool called game over. Now let's go back to Unity and see if this actually works. Okay, so here we are in the starting position. I'll just jump up a little bit. And then if I fall off the screen, we can see that it restarts. So it looks like it's working. Okay, it definitely didn't work there. Okay, so I already know the reason why this is happening. Let's go back to our game controller and see what's going on. Remember, we're checking to see if game over is true, and if it is, then we're not doing anything. So all we did was we forgot to set game over to false. We would wanna do that inside the reset function. So let's go and make sure we say game over is now equal to false. And then we can go back and we should be able to see this working properly. Okay, so I'll jump up a little bit. We lost there, we should be able to lose again. Okay, so it looks like it's actually working now. You can see that the player snaps back to the correct position of negative four. The main camera comes back to its initial position as well. So it looks like this is working. Now what we need to do is implement the same thing whenever we actually run into some of these obstacles. Okay, so to detect the lose state for the obstacles, 
what we need to do is create a new script that goes on our obstacle. So let's take this for example. So any, any moving object on the obstacle will have a script on it that's going to check for trigger events. That trigger event is going to tell the game controller that the player just uh, hit something and that will trigger the reset function or the game over function. So let's, let's start off with this obstacle two and let's start off by adding a box collider to each of the obstacle elements. So let's see here. We should be able to see a green outline. I can barely see a green outline there. Just to verify that that trigger is the correct size. And then don't forget to uh, click the is trigger boolean. And then we'll just do the same thing here. Okay. Once we do that, we want to make sure we click on the parent of the prefab. Click on this overrides drop down if you're using this version of Unity and then click apply all. So that applies to the prefab. We'll do this for uh, obstacle zero and obstacle one. So let's just add box colliders to these. Make sure you're adding box collider 2D, otherwise this won't work. There we go, so I'll click apply all. And then finally for the last obstacle here, make sure that that is trigger and then we'll apply this prefab as well. Okay, so we need to, maybe I shouldn't have applied those yet. We actually need to create a script that goes on each one of these. So let's go to our scripts in our game directory and we'll create a new c -sharp script called obstacle. Let's open that up. Okay, so I'll start off with just a clean script here, get rid of some of this boilerplate and I'll add my region, of course, for Unity functions. This is gonna be a very simple script, but it's just good to get into the habit of creating structured code here. So we're going to have, let's see, we could have a reference to the game controller as a member variable, or we could just access that instance on the fly. Regardless, our Unity function is going to, uh, our region is going to define the on trigger enter 2D. So we'll say private void on trigger enter 2D. We'll be accepting a collider 2D as a parameter to this function. And inside of here, what we want to do is just check to see if this collider is the player. To do that, we can say if col.gameObject.tag.equals and then pass in this string constant player. So if this is the player, this is how we know this is the player. So if this is the player, then what we want to do is just say the, just we want to access the game controller and tell it to reset or something like that. So we'll come back to our game controller and make sure that we actually do have that public instance. We do. And all we're doing is when that happens, when the player actually hits that object, we're just calling this reset function here. Actually, because this reset function is private, we might want to keep that private. Instead, what we could have is a public function here called on player hit obstacle. And then here we would just call reset like that. And we can call this public method from the obstacle class. Okay. Let's go back to Unity and make sure this obstacle script is on all of our obstacle elements. And then we'll make sure we save those prefabs and test to see if this works. Okay, so we wanna test this for each one of the obstacles. We only have three, so it shouldn't take long to run through them all. So here's our first one. So we hit that and it actually reset the game for us. Let's hit this one. Okay, and it reset the game for us. Let's see if we can get past this. That one's a little bit tricky. We might have to scale that one up. Okay, so it looks like all three of our obstacles are causing us to lose. So we're off to a good start now. Instead of just jolting the player and the camera back to the start position, ideally we would wanna have some sort of game over screen. So let's go ahead and implement that right now. 
Let's start off by creating a canvas for our game over screen. Our canvas can just be called UI. That's good enough. We want to make sure it's overlay, which is the default. I usually scale with screen size on the canvas scaler. And then I just set the match to 0.5. And other than that, everything is okay. We'll just start off by creating an empty object, which is going to be the page itself. We'll call this game over page. Now on our UI element on our canvas, we want to make sure we have the page controller object, which comes from our unity core scripts. We'll make sure that we're debugging that. And you can see here, the goal is to add a game over page inside the pages array. So here is eventually where we'll also have the, uh, we'll also have the main menu page in the next tutorial. We'll add that here as well. But for now, let's just design our game over screen. So we'll have some sort of UI. You can either take up the whole screen. You're kind of um, in charge of the design at this point. I think maybe what I'll do is only take up part of the screen, something like this. So maybe we can say 400 width and 400 height, something like that. It doesn't really matter at this point. We're just trying to get some basic functionality and some of the stuff that we want to add to our game over screen would be the player score, a uh, button that restarts the game. So let's just start off with those two elements. We'll also end up having a title as well. So the title would you know, tell us that the game is over. So let's add this text element here. Just say game over. I'll use best fit on the text and then make sure that I center it like this. Okay, and I'll name this title. Okay, so we'll also have a text element for the player score. Some other things that you might add to the game over screen would be the player's best score. You might also give them options to watch ads to continue going, or you might give them options to uh, use sort of in-game currency to continue moving on. You'd also give them the option to go back to the main menu here, but all of that is up to you. You can add whatever information you need to in the game over screen, obviously. For now, we'll just have the player score as one of the text elements. And this will be something that we end up modifying later I want to set the size to be a little bit smaller. So maybe I'll just reduce the size of the rect, something like that. And then of course we want to add the, the button that actually restarts the game. So I'll add a button down here. This will be our reset button. We can say, try again here. Of course the design again is all up to you guys. So th these are the bare minimum specifications for our game over screen. And the only other thing that I would wanna do is move my anchors up to make sure that this would conform to any sort of stretching caused by different resolutions. I'm not sure that would happen with the current canvas scaler settings, but I like to just make sure. So our game over page is going to have a custom page script, which is going to derive from our Unity core page class. Let's go into our game directory and add a new directory called UI, just like that. We're going to have this called game over page. And again, this is going to derive from our Unity core page script. Let's open this up. To do that, we want to make sure that we derive from or we want to make sure that we first import unity core.menu and then we want to make sure we derive from page. Okay, so let's open up our page class and we are going to have to add a virtual member to this. So we want to know essentially when the, the, the page is enabled. When the page is enabled, we want to capture the player's current score and display that. And we also want to store a reference to the game controller. So 
let's just create a, a virtual method inside this. Um, this is something that I may end up updating in the Unity core script. So if you already see this function inside your page class, then don't worry about adding this. But right now it's not actually in there yet. This is going to be a protected virtual void method. That just means that it's overridable. And we're going to say this is on page enabled. On page enabled gets called in the on enable function. And then we can override this function inside our derived class. So we'll go back to the game over page. We'll have a new region for override functions. And then we'll override that function, protected override void on page enabled. And so here we can do any sort of page initialization while we derive the page class. So again, what we want to do here is capture the player score and display it. And then maybe even just store a reference to the game. Although we could just access the instance on the fly. So let's not worry about that. We'll have a public function for the button to access. That's going to be called try again. So public void try again. And this is where we would we would ask the game to reset. So tell the game to reset. And then we'll also close this menu page. So we'll end up creating a function in the game controller class called try again. And then to close the page, we'll say page controller dot instance dot turn page off. And then we'll just pass type in. So type is a member in the parent class that refers to the type of this page. Let's go to the page and make sure that that is accessible right now. So that is a public type, so that is accessible. Okay, and that actually reminds me that we need to open up our page type and make sure we have a game over type inside our page type enumeration. So make sure you add that as well. Okay, let's add this try again function in the game controller. So that will essentially be duplicating this function. We'll just call it try again. We could have one function for any sort of like restart. We could just make reset a public function. Of course, that is totally up to you guys if you want to do that. Let's go back to Unity and see how to set all of this up. Okay, to hook this up, we want to click on our game over page, add the game over page script, make sure that the type is the new enumerated type that we created, game over, and up to you if you want to use animation, that's an optional feature, but for now we're not going to set that up. We also want to make sure that the reset button is calling the correct function here, so we'll drag in the game over page and then find the try again function. So anytime we click the reset button, it'll call that try again function, which tells the game controller to reset. Okay, um, let's see what else we need to do. That might be it. Uh, of course, we do need to go to the page controller and make sure that we add this page reference. Let's do that. And I think we may have forgotten in the game controller to turn on the game over page whenever we lose. So let's go back to the game controller really quick and make sure we do that. So back in the game controller, we want to say that when we end the game, we turn on the game over screen. So we can say page controller dot instance, dot turn page on. And the page type that we want to turn on is the game over page. Because we are referencing the game controller here, we want to make sure that we have the correct using statement for the menu. So we'll say using unity core dot menu. Now let's go back to unity and see if all this works. Okay, so when we actually lose, we should see the game over screen pop up. And we do need to stop resetting forcefully whenever the game is over. Let's go back to the game controller really quick. 
So what we need to do is come down to our end game function and get rid of this reset function. So the only time that we reset should actually be based on, uh, should be triggered by the game over controller. So that means that when we hit the obstacle, we don't want to reset, but we do want to call end game. So let's follow this logic really quick. When we hit the obstacle, we call end game. End game turns on the game over page. So this should work. Let's go back to Unity and try it out. Okay, so we'll press play. And then if I hit the obstacle, the game over screen comes on. And if I hit try again, then it resets. Of course, the problem here is that when the game is over, we can still see everything moving. The player falls down. Ideally, you know, it's fine if everything else is moving, but we definitely want the player to stay where he's at. So we want to make sure that we pause the player movement and we can create a new function in the player controller called lose or die or whatever you guys want. And inside there, we would have some control over the movement of the player. So let's, let's try to figure that out really quick. Okay, so we actually do have a comment here for uh, pausing the player. Let's say player.pause, just like that. And we'll go to the player controller and add that function for pause. Of course, if we are pausing the player, then we wanna make sure that at some point we're unpausing, so that could be in the reset function. Let's go back to the game controller. So yeah, when we call reset, we, we tell the player to reset, so we could unpause the player in the reset function. Uh, inside the player controller, we'll want to have a Boolean called pause. And inside update, we'll say if the game is paused or if the player is paused rather, then we just wanna return. So this would stop all movement and all events on the player. So inside pause, we'll just say pause is equal to true. And inside reset, we'll say pause is equal to false. And then let's go back to Unity and see if this works. Okay, so I'll run into something here to end the game and we don't see the player falling off the screen, so that's a good sign. But when I hit try again, the player can now move. And let's try this where we just fall off the screen and we don't actually hit anything. Okay. So we can see here that the player stopped uh, whenever they reached this point. This is actually good for us too because we can see exactly where the player needs to be for the game to be over. We might want this to be more off screen so it doesn't feel as jumpy, but this might also be fine as well. It might not actually be an issue. What we're going to end up doing is triggering a particle effect and, uh, and hiding the actual player object. So that might not be an issue. Now, currently we have an invincibility pickup and a score pickup that aren't actually being used at the moment. Right now we have player death being tracked and we have the game over screen. So we can actually test the invincibility pickup right now. We don't have score tracking yet, so we can't really test the score pickup, but because we are tracking the lost state, we can actually test the invincibility pickup. Let's find the invincibility pickup in the game. So we're looking for a blue pickup here. And we just want to see if that's going to, we just want to prove right now that that's not going to actually do anything. So this is a score pickup here. That's obviously not going to do anything. Okay, so here we have an invincibility pickup. So when I hit that, you can see that I can still run into objects and die. So we want to make sure that when we pick up that blue pickup, that we can remain invincible for an extended period of time. So to do this, we would add a new function called enforce pickup rules. And inside this function, what we would do is have some sort of timer that would be incrementing our invincibility timer, detecting if the timer is greater than the expected duration. And if it is, then we would cancel out the effect. So let's see what this looks like. We'll keep a reference to a delta time for all other pickup effects. And then we'll set that equal to time.delta time. 
then what we'll end up doing is incrementing the invincibility duration. So we'll say the, or I'm sorry, decrementing the duration. So we'll say um, invincibility duration is going to be reduced by delta time. So remember, we are reducing this value because we're initializing the duration to the, the um, constant up here. We can see or to the, to the duration. So so let's recap what's going on here because in the last episode, uh, we created these functions and we may have forgotten, I definitely did. And we can see here that in the handle invincibility pickup function, we have the duration parameter that's coming in. That's what we set invincibility duration to. So the point is, this is a non-zero value. And what we're doing is we're decrementing the, the value of duration over time when that duration reaches a value of zero, we know we can turn off the invincibility boolean. Okay, so let's find our function here. So what we do is we say if the so if the invincibility duration is less than or equal to zero, then what we want to do is just say the that invincible is equal to false. And in fact, we would only want this condition to evaluate to true if invincible is true. So we can also say inside this condition, if the duration is less than or equal to zero and, and the invincible bool is true. And then what we could do is also just make sure that invincibility duration is equal to zero, but that's not necessarily uh, required. Okay, so with that, we should be able to pick up the blue pickup, which is the invincibility pickup, and we should be able to run through all of the obstacles without losing. Let's go back to Unity and verify the number of seconds that we have that pickup set to. Okay, so our pickups here, we have the invincibility pickup. Let's click on that. Let's see, let's look at the actual child object. And we can see that the duration of the invincibility pickup is four seconds. So we can count down from four and uh, after four seconds is up, then we would obviously be losing when we run into stuff. So let's play this until we find an invincibility pickup. Okay, so here's an invincibility pickup. I'll click that. Okay, so we definitely hit it, but we weren't invincible. So we, we have the invincible bool, but apparently we're not using that to um, invalidate any sort of player collision. Let's go back to the game controller and see what we need to do for that. Okay, so we have this on player hit obstacle function. So it actually is a good thing that this is a separate function because what we do here is just say, if invincible, then return. Let's go back to Unity and test this. Okay, so during my last testing uh, period, I realized that one of our obstacles is way too difficult. So I'm just gonna remove that one. I think it was obstacle number two. I'm just gonna remove that for now because that that is just annoying to play with right now. Okay, and uh, again, I'm gonna be looking for that blue pickup. And now we should definitely not be losing when we run into stuff. So let's see, and I'm passing right through these. I'll pick up another one here. And after about four seconds, the effect will wear off. So we're getting pretty lucky here. We're picking up all the invincibility pickups, no score pickups being dropped. That's just how it goes sometimes. Okay, so we, we should be getting to the point now where if I run into one, I should be losing. Okay, it's definitely been more than four seconds and I'm not losing. Uh, or maybe well, we, we can go back and check the timer, but it looks like eventually I did lose. Um, it seemed a little bit slower, but that's just something that I'll have to keep an eye on. So we've tested the invincibility rules and now we want to actually start tracking score so that we can finally test the score pickup. Okay, and then Throughout that process, we'll be posting the player score on the game over screen. Okay, so probably the easiest way to do this would just be to create a public integer 
so that uh, that's accessible by the game controller. So we'll have a public int score, but we do wanna have control over who can set the score. We only really want the game controller to be able to set the score. So we can say score uh, with a private getter and I'm sorry, with a public getter. So that would just be this and a private setter. So this means that only the game controller can modify score, but anybody who has access to the instance can get the score. Okay, so now the question is, when do we increment the score? And basically anytime we increment the progress for the player, we want to increment the score for the player. So where we have the check player progress function and we're incrementing the player progress, here is where we can uh, set the score to be incremented by the score multiplier, which would be one unless we pick up the score pickup, in which case it would be whatever that multiple is. So we also wanna make sure that we're resetting the score value whenever the game restarts. So inside the reset function where we have our comment to reset the score to zero, we'll just simply say score is equal to zero there. And with that, we should be about ready to test, but I do wanna double check that our, well, right now our score pickup actually isn't working. So let's, let's go ahead and add some code to the enforced pickup rules. It's going to be very similar to what we did for the invincibility rules. Basically what we'll be doing is saying that the score multiplier duration is going to be reduced by a value of delta time as well. And then we'll be checking to see if the score multiplier duration is less than or equal to zero. And also if the score multiplier is not already equal to one, which is the reset value. So we can say, and score multiplier is not already equal to one. In this case, what we would do is set the score multiplier equal to one. And that's it. So this indicates the reset value for our score, mul score multiplier. And with that, we should be able to go back to Unity and test this. So the invincibility pickup and the score pickups should both be working at this point. So at this point, it's going to be pretty difficult to know what the actual score is because we're not visualizing the score anywhere. So one thing that we need to do before we move on is create some new UI that's going to tell us what the score actually is. So let's just add some score text into our existing UI here. I'll just add a text element and I'll double click that so I can get a good view. I'll put this into my top left corner and then give it some sort of padding of about 12. The design here isn't super important, of course. We just want to visualize the score text. And uh, I'll make this a little bit bigger so it's easier to see. Okay, so I think that's pretty good for now. And now that we have this new score text, we want to have a reference to this in our game controller. And then every time that we increment the score, or change the score, we want to make sure that the score text is changing appropriately as well. So let's go back to the script, the game controller, and see what we need to add. So we're going to want a public reference to the text component, we'll call the score text. And because we're using the text component or the text type, we want to make sure that we're using unityengine.ui so we can access that object type. So now any place that we change the value of score, we also want to change the value of score text. So I'll look for all the instances of score here. And anytime that we're incrementing it or changing it, we wanna make sure that we set the score text dot text equal to score dot two string. So I'll find other instances of where we're setting this. And it looks like we're only setting it here so we're only setting it in two places right now. And at this point, we should be able to go back to Unity and watch our score as it gets updated. Okay, so before we start, you'll want to remember to go to the game controller object and fill in the empty field called score text with the newly created UI text element. Then we can press play and start visualizing our score in the top left corner. So we can see it's incrementing by one now we will need to actually set the score in the game over screen, but for now what we're doing is just testing the score pickup. So let's make sure that score pickup works. 
And when we pick up the pink pickup, we would expect to see the score incrementing by a value of two. Okay, so here's a score pickup. And now every time I go through, we're incrementing by two. Went from 13 to 15, 15 to 17. And then we're just gonna try to keep playing until that effect wears off. So now we're incrementing by one again because that effect is worn off. So it looks like the pickups are definitely working. Now we need to make sure that when we hit the game over screen, we are telling the player what their score was whenever they lost. And then um, every time the page is enabled again, it'll be checking for the new current score. So let's go back to the game controller and see what we need to do. Okay, so remember every time the game ends, we are turning on the game over page. And every time we turn on the game over page, this function on page enabled gets called. So that means that all we need to do is get a reference from our game over page. We need to get a reference of our score text, just like we did, just like we did in the game controller. And because we're using that object type, we want to make sure that we're using Unity Engine.UI. Okay, so every time on page enabled is called, we would simply say score text dot text is equal to, of course, we want whatever um, whatever specific text in our whatever specific verbiage in our game over page to be prepended uh, by the score. So in our case, we're saying player score with a colon, and then we're appending the game controller dot instance dot score value and we'll say that that's two string. Okay, so uh, let's go back to Unity and play this and see if this works. So because we added a new public parameter to our game over page, we wanna make sure that we're filling that with the appropriate um, component. So we have the score text here. We just wanna drag that into the score text. And now we should be able to play this and see our score displayed on the game over screen. So I'll go ahead and lose. Now we can see player score is equal to one, but if I play again and I get a different score, you can see that that score changes. Okay, so um, having this, having this, uh, this sort of view controller, the page controller, uh, where our individual pages inherit from the base page class, makes it very easy to update individual UI pages, and hopefully this demonstrates that effectively. All right, now the final thing that I want to cover in this tutorial is actually playing some sort of animation when the player loses. And that animation is going to be a particle effect. So let's go to the player object here and add a particle effect. That'll be just this particle system that is added as a new component. So we'll say particle system. And let's just sort of go through some of these settings and decide how we want this to look. All right, so we basically want this to look like some sort of explosion. So we, we do want the duration to be fairly short. We'll set duration to 0 0.25. I'll turn off looping here because we only want this to play once. We'll set the start delay to zero. We'll leave that. We'll set the start lifetime to a value of two. We'll, we'll set the speed to a well, let's see, this is only the start speed. So we can just say the start speed is a constant value, I suppose, five is fine. The start size is pretty important. So we do want this to be a fairly small size, say 0 0.1. And at any time that you are modifying the particle system, you can go to the particle effect window here in the scene view, just press play, and you can see sort of what it looks like. Okay. So we don't have that many particles coming off of the player yet, and they are moving a little bit slow, but I think the size is okay. Let's, let's go to the speed. I think there was a start speed here. Let's increase this to 10. And maybe we'll try 20. Okay, I think that's good there. And let's see what else we can do. Let's go to a mission and increase the rate over time to something like 200 and then restart. Okay, so now we have a lot of particles uh, sort of exploding off of the player, which is what we want. I'll reduce that. 
Okay. We can also change the uh, the shape. So how do we want these coming off? I would change the radius. I think the shape is fine. I'll change the radius to 0.1. That'll make it look like the particles are coming um, close. They're, they're spawning closer to the player. So it looks like the player is actually the source of the explosion. So this is starting to look okay for now. I don't want to go too in depth with the particle system because this is something that you can spend hours tweaking. So the last thing that I want to do for this is simply um, change the color and the shape of the particles themselves because right now they're just pink squares. So let's go to the renderer and we want to add a material for our, uh, our particles. And we could just choose sprites default. We'll restart and now we can see that these are white squares but maybe they should be circles instead. So let's let's see if we can get one of our circles, uh, circular sprites here. Maybe just this default particle. Okay, and I think that's fine for now for the purpose of this tutorial. Um, at this point, we want to figure out how to play the animation uh, once whenever the player loses and then get rid of the actual circle that is the player. So what we'll end up doing is accessing the particle system API to play the animation and then we'll have an access to the sprite renderer from the player controller that's going to tell us to toggle this on and off at the appropriate time. Okay so we'll need two references in our player controller. One would be for the sprite renderer so we'll have sprite renderer and then we'll also have one for the particles. So that'll be particle system, and we'll call this particles. And what we wanna do is every time we, we pause the player, which would indicate that the player has lost, then we would actually spawn the particles and hide the renderer. So we could say something like sprite.enabled is equal to false and particles dot play. So uh, there's a play function on the particles class that we can call that will actually play that animation for us. And then every time we reset, we wanna make sure that the sprite becomes visible again. So we'll say sprite dot enabled is equal to true now. So let's get back to Unity and see if this works. Well, actually, before we do that, we want to go ahead and assign a value to each one of these. So on init, we want to say the sprite is equal to get component, sprite render, and similar for the particles, we'll say that is equal to get component particle system. Because the assumption here is that the particle system and the sprite renderer components are both on the same object as the player controller. But if we do want to enforce that so that we can ensure that these values are never null, we can enforce that by adding the require component class attribute. So require component, and we can say type of sprite render, and then same thing for the particle system. So again, what this does is it enforces these components onto the same object as the player controller, which means that these values should never be null. Now we can go back to Unity and test if this works. Okay, so we'll press play, and we can see when we press play, the particles actually play. We wanna make sure that the play on awake uh, boolean is not true. So let's go to our particle system. There should be a play on awake bool here, and we'll just disable that. So we'll go ahead and play again, and that looks better. And now whenever we run into something, we can see the particle effect plays. The player is hidden if we take a look at the scene view here. And then if we hit try again, the player is visible again. Okay. So a couple of things, whenever the player actually dies, the game over screen shows right over the player. So we never really appreciate the particle effect that's playing. One thing that we can do to um, improve that is wait for about a second whenever the player dies before actually showing the game over screen. So let's go back into the game controller so I can show you guys how to do that. Okay, so in the game controller, we'll want to come over here and first at the top of your script, add system.threading.tasks. 
And the reason we're doing that is because we want to have some control over how long we wait before opening up the game over screen. So for this end game function, we'll add uh, the async keyword, which just flags the signature as a function that is, that is asynchronous, which means we can actually put some await logic in here. Okay, so before we actually show the game over screen, what we'll do is we'll just say await task.delay, and then we'll just wait for one second. So this is uh, milliseconds that we're passing into the delay function. And again, what we're saying is after we actually pause the player, which in turn plays that animation, then we want to wait for a second and then open up the game over screen. So let's go back to Unity and check if this works. Okay, so I'll play the game here. And if I run into something, you can see that the player, we can actually see the player animation and then the game over screen pops up a few moments later. So that's exactly what we would want. And at this point, I would say just play the game uh, that you have so far and add whatever new obstacles you want to because in the next episode, we're gonna be wrapping things up with a splash screen, a main menu screen, and some audio effects that we're gonna be sprinkling throughout the game. Uh, so it's going to be a fairly straightforward tutorial coming up, but that's going to conclude this tutorial. We went over a lot today. We covered score tracking, game over screen. We also covered player death and enforcing some of our pickup rules. So yes, we did cover a lot in this tutorial, but I hope you guys enjoyed. And if you did, go ahead and drop a like, subscribe and add notifications so that you can catch all of our new tutorials coming up throughout the year. But as always guys, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next tutorial.